Welcome, my name is Harald Sack and this is Knowledge Graphs, lecture number 5 for Ontological Engineering for Smarter Knowledge Graphs. In this very last part of the lecture, we are talking about ontologies and knowledge graphs best practices. So, we know now how to create, how to design ontologies, how to design better ontologies, how to evaluate, we did ontological engineering and stuff like that. It's time now to give good advice for the practice. And the very first thing is, of course, we have to compare always ontologies with our reality. So the question is, in how far is it necessary that our ontology really reflects, let's say, the complete reality? We know ontologies are only a model, a conceptual model, which means a conceptual part that is necessary to represent exactly only those things that we want to solve with respect to our application that we have in mind, that we want to solve. So ontologies are not the reality. If ontology is an, uh, ontology is an interpretation of reality, that's true. However, we have already seen there, considering the level of generality what we want to do, we have the possibility to create different types and categories of ontology. Nevertheless, we have to be careful. As I said, ontologies are interpretations of reality and what might happen is exactly what here a very famous author, Jorge Luis Borges, um, explained once in an essay. So it was in 1942 that he wrote the analytical language of John Wilkins and he gave a very famous example of what can happen if you define an ontology. And he said, yeah, this is various categories of animals from a certain Chinese encyclopedia and they define the realm of animals and categorize it in the following way. So they say animals can be distinguished in those that belong to the emperor, the embalmed ones, those that are trained, suckling pigs, mermaid, mermaids or sirens, fabulous ones, stray dogs, those that are included in this classification, those that tremble as if they were mad, innumerable ones and those drawn with a very fine camel hair brush, etc. and those that have been just broken the flower ways. Oh my god! <laughs> and those that at a distance resemble flies. You see, creating an ontology, if the interpretation depends on your personal viewpoint, can be completely different as that of somebody else. So it should be focused on exactly the purpose that you have in mind. If this really fits your purpose, that this is the ontology you have to use, this is the ontology you are going to use. But don't take it as the reality. So your ontology is not your reality. It's just an interpretation according to your purpose. So whenever you are going to define and design a new ontology, the question is first that you should ask yourself, do I really need an ontology? Is this really not necessary? So what helps this ontology? Is it possible to do exactly the same thing with a traditional data structure or do I really need or make use of the opportunities and the possibilities I have if I really are using an ontology? This means how important is, let's say, the purpose of data integration? How important is it to map to other kind of data? How important is it to enable reasoning, for example. Ontology engineering always is an effort and involves a lot of complexity. So this question is really important. Ask yourself, do I really need an ontology? If it gives me you know, benefits, definitely yes, then go for it. Second thing, whenever you are going to define an ontology, ask yourself, what exactly is the purpose of my ontology that it serves for? In my experience, and I do this now for decades, I often experience, let's say, groups, institutes and companies that said, yeah, we have to define an ontology simply because it's, yeah, it's part of the project and somebody wrote in the project proposal, do an ontology. And of course, we got funding for that. So we define an ontology for our task. And what they are ending up to do is, in the end, they are creating an ontology or trying to create an ontology not only for the task at hand, but for the entire domain, because they say, yeah, if we define that one and it should be somehow self-contained, then of course we have also to define this and this and this, and this is dependent on this and this. 
and you will end up soon at a point that will never stop because it becomes way too complex, way too many people have to be involved and this is really a complicated process. So therefore, be focused, stay focused, what's the purpose of the ontology? This should be my model and nothing else. Another thing, of course, yeah, what's the intuition behind the names of all of the things you define there? So when you take a closer look at your terminology and the names of your classes, of your properties, of your axioms, always keep in mind, say what you mean and mean what you say. Don't be ambiguous. Don't talk in metaphors. So somebody else who is reading that and seeing that should know what you are doing. And we have always talked and uh, also showed you what's the difficulty if you really use self-speaking and understandable names as identifiers for things in relation to what happens when you take, let's say, for example, identifiers that are just numbers. So this is also a difference. If you are using names for things, you are, of course, then involving further implicit semantics in that that might or might not be appropriate, depending on who exactly is looking at that. So, whenever you say something, say what you mean and mean what you say when you define your ontology. Another common mistake is, of course, correct or, in that case, incorrect taxonomical structures. However, often experienced domain modelers can see that the correct way to structure a taxonomy, but they are typically unable to justify their decisions. And one of the problems there is that often these kind of subsumption hierarchies, or subclass hierarchies that are, they are creating, they are sometimes misused, representing relationships that aren't really subsumptions. You see here that example on the side, so let me quickly switch on the laser pointer to show you that. We have here our course, KG 2023, which is of course an OpenHPI lecture. OpenHPI lecture is put under OpenHPI, which is put under HPI, under faculty, which is a university or which is part of the university. Okay, so faculty is not an university, it's part of an university. HPI is a faculty, that's clear, yeah. Open HPI is a uh, part of HPI or something like that. Open HPI lecture is, of course, part of that. And Knowledge Graph 2023 is an Open HPI lecture. You see, there are many different relations involved which are not necessarily a subclass relation. Of course, these are broader concepts, but it's not a real subsumption. What is a subsumption? Subsumption is also a, is a relationship and this is used to construct concept hierarchies. Formally, you see A subsumes B means B is a subclass of A if all instances of B are necessarily also instances of A. Yeah. And this also attributes, properties, characteristics of a superclass. They are all inherited along the hierarchy to all subclasses. But unfortunately, this assumption relation is often misused or confused. So, let's take a first example when subsumption often is confused with instantiation. So look at that, I say here Harald is a human, which is clear, and human is a mammal, that's also clear, as well as human is a species. But what now is really subsumption and what is just instantiation? As we can see here, of course, Harald is an instance of human, so I'm an element of the set of humans. However, human is a subclass of mammal. They both are classes and they are related via subclass. While human is a specific species, so it's an instance of species. So often instance of relationships, which would be reflected with RDF type, are here also mistaken with subclass relationships and they should not be mixed. Another source of confusion is also meronomy or also called partonomy. Look at the following example. I simply say here, engine is a subclass of car. Sounds already not so nice, so, but what is the reason that this is not necessarily correct? So some essential properties of cars, essential properties are functional properties, for example, um, being able to accommodate people. An engine also has functional properties that are essential properties, like for example, being able to crank and generate a rotational force. However, essential properties of cars do not apply to, essential uh, to engines. 
Therefore, a car cannot subsume engine, simply because a car, of course, has not the functional property of being able to crank and generate rotational force. Usually not, of course. <laughs> so, the right description would be that engine is a part of the car. Next confusion would be disjunction, for example. If I say engine is a subclass of car parts, yeah, not all engine are car parts. Take a boat engine, for example. Vice versa, car parts are a subclass of the class of all engines, fenders, windscreens, doors and seats. So, that's also not necessarily, let's say, the best way to, to model that. So what you should say, an engine might be a subclass, of course, of all engines, fenders, wheels, windscreen seats, which are here really parts of a car. That might then fit quite well. Okay, next one. Subsumption confused with constitution. What happens here? We have here, ocean is a subclass of water. Sounds a bit strange, so what's the problem here? Look at instances. So an instance of water, what's that? Yeah, that's a handful of water, a glass of water. So a specific amount of water would be an instance of water. An instance of ocean would be one of the oceans of the Earth, the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, or something like that. However, oceans are made up of amounts of water. So the correct way to do that would again be a patonomy but the other way around, that water, of course, is part of an ocean. So, you see, it's sometimes not so easy to deal with, let's say, the simplest of all um, relations, which is here the subsumption relation. In the end, what we want to guarantee with a proper ontology design is, of course, that our data structures, our knowledge graphs that we are creating, they are fair, they are findable, accessible and interoperable, as well as reusable. So let's have a quick look again on these criteria, on the FAIR principles that we have already learned about in the second week of this lecture, or in the first week already. So findable means the first step in reusing data is to find them, of course. Metadata and data should be easy to find for both, humans and computers. So first criteria, metadata are assigned a globally unique and persistent identifier. In our case, this would be an IRI. Data are described with rich metadata. You can do this, for example, via RDF. Metadata clearly and explicitly include the identifier of the data they describe. Of course, that's what we are doing in the semantic web. Then metadata are registered or indexed in a searchable resource. That would be nice. So if it's on the web, then of course, in the end, it's also searchable if, you know, uh, yeah, comply to the W3C standards. Look at accessibility. So once the user finds the required data, he, she or they need to know how it can be accessed, possibly including authentication and authorization. So metadata have to be retrievable by their identifier using a standard protocol. For our semantic web stuff, of course, we have an IRI, we have the HTTP protocol everything very standard. So the protocol is open and free and universally implementable and the protocol allows for authentication and authorization wherever necessary, which of course with HTTP is also possible. By that metadata are accessible even when the data are no longer available. Of course that is uh, a more difficult thing, however, for example, if you are part of a search engine, then it might also be the case that your data is not available anymore. However, the search engine entry is still there and there is at least some metadata available. But this is not what is meant here. So this is also difficult then to comply for A2. Interoperability. The data usually needs to be integrated with other data. In addition, the data need to interoperate with applications or workflows for analysis, storage and processing. So what does that mean? So metadata use usually formal, accessible, shared and broadly applicable language for knowledge representation. Clearly, that's the W3C standards in our case. Metadata also use vocabularies that follow the FAIR principles. There are many around in the semantic web. And data and metadata include qualified references to other metadata. So you remember the linked data principles, we have to link to other things. 
This is what is here for the interop interoperability constraint in the FAM principles. Last point, reusability. The ultimate goal, of course, is to optimize the reuse of data. To achieve this, metadata and data should be well described so that they can be replicated and or combined in different settings. What does that mean? Our, our metadata or data is richly described with a plurality of accurate and relevant attributes and the metadata are released with a clear and accessible data usage license, so don't forget licensing, and of course they are associated with detailed provenance wherever possible. And metadata meet domain relevant community standards, so that's bit more difficult to maintain, so that's not automatically, also not automatic with the linked data principles, so you have to take care to comply to these principles, because reuse is essential, because then you don't have to reinvent the wheel over and over again. Just to remember it, our linked data principles, use URIs as names for things, use HTTP URIs so people can look up those names, and whenever somebody looks up that URI user useful, uh, provide useful information in terms using the standards, which is RDF or Sparkle, and include links to other URIs so that users can discover more things amongst the web of linked data. And this now brings us to an end of this week of the lecture. In the next week, we are going to look at intelligent applications based on knowledge graphs and deep learning.